Andrew Conway, welcome to the Business Advisory Show. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, John. Good to be with you. Yeah, terrific. Uh, we love uh, a few things about the IPA, but I'm going to ask you about those things and hear it from, from you. Um, what do you see on the horizon for accountants and bookkeepers as some of the challenges in helping small business uh, from, from here on in? Well, there's the ongoing challenge around red tape regulation. That's the sort of stock standard challenges. Some of the other challenges that are sort of coming to the fore are issues around what role will data play, big data, you know, AI and so forth. And our response to some of those things, we're not sort of resisting the change in relation to data and, uh, and artificial intelligence. Because our view is that as good as AI is, you know, emotional intelligence is always better. And so I think the role that we have in small practice in particular is to make sure we're absolutely articulating the case that engaging an accountant is still the best way to navigate through complex uh, times. And so when you're sitting opposite an accountant, you got a client on one side, the accountant on the other, it's that FaceTime, you know, the real FaceTime, not the, the virtual FaceTime that really matters. Yeah, absolutely. And <clears throat> there's an enormous amount of, uh, I think, anxiety in many ways around this term of business advisory. Um, what, is, what does it mean to yourself? Mm. Well, it's doing what we've always done. You know, it's not a new thing, business advisory. In many ways, you know, the use of data and technology is going to enable accountants really to do their work faster, more efficiently, which means you're going to have more time in front of a client. What are you going to do with that time? And our challenge to our, to our members is making sure they've got the skills to have those deeper conversations with clients. So it's, it's basically, you know, it's, it's something we shouldn't resist and it's something we've always done. You know, the profession's been around for centuries. Um, we've always adapted to new tools and resources. This is just another wave of tools and resources evolving. Yeah, um, and uh, we hear all sorts of um, versions of what's going to happen to mm. compliance. So personally, mm. I think it's got a long uh, journey ahead. Uh, but uh, what, what would you say to that? Look, I don't buy the argument that compliance is dead at all. Yeah. I think uh, it's always going to be around. We've got a pretty complex tax system in Australia, and that will always require expertise. And that's really why you have a profession. Yeah, you know, Professions evolve over many, many years. In fact, centuries they evolve. Uh, because you start with a, a hobby and a skill that evolves to a profession. It's a refined skill over time. And that happens because we have a complex set of laws in Australia in tax law in particular, and when a person engages an accountant, they're engaging them for their professionalism. So I think we'll always have that role of compliance because I can't see any time soon when a government's going to simplify tax as much as we'd love that. I think we'll always have a complex tax system and we'll have complex life events that require that navigation. Yeah, thank you. And now, let's say I'm a, a budding young uh, accountant coming through and you are. not... Uh, <laughs> 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 and, and, uh, and I'm... Or I'm perhaps uh, got prior quals in another country and I'm yeah. migrating to Australia and I'm weighing up my options. Why yeah. would I choose IPA? Well, I, I'd sort of zoom out of the conversation a little bit and say, why would you choose a professional association full stop? Yeah. And I think it's a, it's a decent conversation to have. You know, we're not immune from those issues that, that members are standing back saying, well, am I getting value from my association? And there are plenty of examples where I think professional bodies have been put through the ringer, quite rightly. And I think we've got to learn from those examples. In our case, we say there is absolutely value. And the value is in maintaining currency of knowledge. You know, we trade as professionals in our currency of knowledge. That's actually what we trade in. People come and see us, they want to know that we've got the most up-to-date knowledge. Our challenge as a professional body is to, when you engage with us, make sure we're giving you that knowledge in a really digestible form format. So we have a mantra that says our material has to be practical, relevant and responsive. Mm -hmm. That means if you come to one of our events, if you walk away with notes that you can't apply, then we've failed and I want to know about it as a CEO. So I think it's that currency of knowledge and making sure you've got an eye to the future but not being burdened with, you know, excess of information. So our job is to help synthesise that. So in our case, we say to a member who's looking at a professional body, if you're interested in supporting 97% of businesses in Australia, maybe the IPA is right for you. And ultimately, our specialisation is small business. That's what we do. That's what our members love us for. We put the picket fence around that and said that's the space we want to own. And we think with our research, with the applied research we've, we've uh, taken up with Deakin Uni, small business white paper, all of our uh, knowledge is, is customised around improving the quality of life of small business. So we think if that's the space for you, then uh, have a chat with us. 
Yeah, fantastic. And something that certainly got my attention, uh, um, congratulations to you for being a bit courageous recently and you know, raising this topic around mental health in mm. small business and, mm. and the role that we might have in the advisory industry to help small business in that regard. Do you mind just making a couple of sure. comments about that? Yeah, look, it, it, this is an issue that came up uh, to us directly from members. So we, we started this process of developing a small business white paper about uh, five years ago. And we got a little bit sick and tired of organisations that were going out claiming to represent small business with actually at, without having any evidence on the table. So we thought, let's go and gather some evidence, we'll get some research on the table, but bring the, the insights together of small business, small practitioners, government uh, and, and the regulators as well. So part of that process was doing some field testing and going around the country and engaging. So we took that to regional and rural Australia. One of the insights was fascinating between 2015 and 2018 that changed was when we said to a small business, what's the number one thing keeping you awake at night? Small businesses weren't saying access to finance, tax, compliance. They're actually saying, we can't keep working nine days a week. Yeah. Like time is tough in that regard. And it was the first time we realised that this was a real issue affecting small business. And, and I suppose the light bulb moment was what role does the accountant play in that? Now, when you look across the world, nowhere in the world is there any evidence that points to the role the accountant plays in improving the quality of life of small business owners and their mental health and, and well-being. So we committed ourselves to engaging that research piece and we put it on the radar, World Congress of Accountants in, in November 2018. I, I raised the topic there um, and some said, oh, it's pretty out there. Some cultures don't like talking about it, that it's taboo. Well, my theory is it's only taboo because we're not talking about it. So we put on the radar and we said, let's start talking about what our role is as a professional body and what we need to do to fix it. Just, I know we love our numbers, John, but pretty staggeringly, you know, there were over a million suicides globally last year. In 2020, it's forecast to go to 1.5 million. So this is a significant issue. And our theory is if our work exposing the role of an accountant in looking at the signs of a client showing signs of mental ill health uh, will help someone get to clinical services faster, job done. If it helps one person, it's worth doing, obviously. So we've got a big role to play. We're partnering with Beyond Blue and a few others. But we do say to anyone who might be experiencing you know, a, a period of mental ill health that you're not alone and there are ways through it and to talk to people, maybe talk to your accountant. So we're building up the resources of our members, we're giving them mental health first aid training, uh, and we're building their resilience to have, and the confidence to have the conversation. But we say to anyone, if you're experiencing those issues, 13, 11, 14, Lifeline's the first bet. Fantastic, it's really great stuff. And, uh, and I, look, I'm seeing this years ago, master builders were saying the same thing about uh, their need for Beyond Blue and mm. uh, suicide rate in the building industry in Melbourne, uh, mm. Victoria, was really sad. Mm. Um, and this is something that uh, all advisors have got to look at too. Now, what is the role that an accountant or bookkeeper can play for small business in the future yeah. if, if they themselves get their time management right, get their core business right? You know, what, you know, what is the significance of that role that they could play? So it's, in, our, in our view, it's all about the value add. So it's, it's looking at a business situation, whether it's a micro business that's home based, it might be at its in, in its infancy. It's looking at that business and saying, wh what is the absolute potential of this business and how can I coach that through? So I think it really is that advisory piece. Certainly the compliance issue, as we discussed before, compliance will continue to be the hook that brings the client to the accountant or the bookkeeper. But ultimately it's going to be, what value can I add? So can I optimise its, its, its operation? I think a golden opportunity for accountants going forward is the management of data. You know, we took this issue up with the International Financial Reporting Standards Foundation. You know, it's, it's not high on the list of things for people to go and do when they go to London, but you go and visit the IFRS Foundation. But you put on the table there and we said, well, how long will it be before we see a, a, an accounting standard that actually values data on a balance sheet? Actually, an organisation's data appearing as an asset. And they actually said they're, they're already thinking about that because, as we all know, on the black market, people can go and buy and sell data, um, you know, and, and sets of data till the cows come home. But whether it's legal or not is another question. But it's, it's a tradable commodity. Mm. So why aren't we valuing it on balance sheets? So I think the accounting standards boards are thinking about that. But I think that's a natural role for us to play in looking at issues around safeguarding and protecting data, making sure we're harnessing it correctly and putting the ring fences around it so that we've got the capacity to recover. I mean, malware, ransomware attacks are on the rise. Every organisation, irrespective of its size, is taking threats. 
So what are we doing as a profession to safeguard the most important asset a business has, and that's its data? Yeah, absolutely. And don't you think that's possibly a massive opportunity too for, oh. the, for the industry? Yeah. Because a small business clearly doesn't, at this point, on the bell curve, really understand the value of, of big data, because that's something corporates know, but, but small business doesn't understand it. Well, they don't. And, and I think the other thing is that the large telcos, as good as they are with the systems they have, they don't have a scalable solution for small business in this space. So we're doing some things as, our, as a professional body of working with partners to provide a more scalable solution so that if you're a small business and, and in the suburbs or, or in the regions of Australia and you're faced with these challenges, you know you've, you're going to at least put, the, put a picket fence around your business to protect it. You know, if someone wants to get in, into your system, they're going to find a way in. I mean, there are examples of using uh, you know, printer ports to access systems and so and that's not just in the movies, it actually does happen. But we've got to look at what is our role in that space and how do we provide a scalable cyber solution and then how do we provide the advice to clients to navigate through that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in terms of navigating change and, and, and the digital evolution for small business, um, is there just a pure niche for accountants and bookkeepers in just better understanding technology as an opportunity to grow their business? There's a bit of a struggle there, I think. I mean, I think there's a, there's a natural resistance because it is a big change. And, you know, there's obviously a generation of accountants coming into the profession now who are, you know, if you, if you forgive the expression, are Indigenous to technology, mm -hmm. whereas most accountants practicing today are refugees to it. Yeah. They've come to it late. Um, and so they're having to learn as they go. And I think what we need to encourage people to do is realize that it's not that abstract a concept to navigate through. So we've got a role to play there in demystifying and just decoding some of that, um, but also encouraging people to lean into the conversation because it's very hard just to go, no, not interested, that's tech, I'm not into that. Well, when you start talking to people, we don't often realise how connected we actually are uh, in our homes and in our workplaces. That you know, the the uh, stats are pointing to on average uh, every household in Australia having more than 40 connected devices to the internet. So this whole thing of the Internet of Things is a real thing, and we're all part of it. So we're already there, whether we realise it or not. Yeah, absolutely. What do you see on the horizon as the two or be, two or th two or three biggest challenges uh, for the industry of, of you know business advice or accountants and bookkeepers? Well, I think maintaining that knowledge base in in such a dynamic environment. You know, we've got whether it's tax law changes and the super changes, whatever the case may be, that day-to-day -day grind that goes on in regulation, that will continue. There's rising costs, I think, in relation to practice that we that sort of just creep up overnight. So when you're in practice, you get the regulator turning up and saying, oh, by the way, there's a new licensing, to, uh, licensing uh, fee you now have to pay, it's compulsory. And you've got no option but to pay it. So there's this rising cost uh, that actually delivers no real return to your business. There's the, the technology stack that's continually changing, so I, I almost think there's a role to play for professional bodies f uh, to actually help their members and help mm -hmm. our members uh, understand that whole, the, the whole app advisory space. Yep. Um, because you go to a tech conference and the, you know, you got the, the number of manufacturers is very, very low. But the number of app providers and solution providers, you, you know, it's it mm. outnumbers it astronomically. Scary, yeah. So I sort of say, well, to the to the tech, I mean, there's a whole different topic. But the tech companies themselves who are manufacturing this stuff, how about you start thinking about the solu security solutions upstream? Anyway, that's another topic. Mm. So I think that navigating that tech stack is really important, uh, and then also just I think un genuinely understanding mental health and well-being. Um, have you got your business structured to the point that you actually can take some time for yourself? Because, you know, or are we talking about the proverbial builder's house that's never finished? Mm -hmm. You know, because the last business in many ways an accountant works on is their own. And what we try and say is you've got to give yourself some time to breathe, both for your own mental health and wellbeing, but also to make sure you're critically analysing whether your business is right for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, finally, your philosophy to leadership. Um, what works for you? What do you think is not so effective and, and, and the best lessons you've learned in, in becoming a leader? I think when I first started, so I started as a CEO very, very young, or comparatively young, so I was 28 when I was appointed. Um, and my, when I was first appointed, I was sort of like a bull at a gate and if someone was having a go at the organisation, I'd sort of go into them sort of full throttle. But you sort of stand back from that and say, well, actually now, why, what's behind that? So, I suppose from a, from a leadership point of view, it's being able just to stand back from a situation critically, and not to be passive, but just to analyse what's going on and be a bit more 
um, assiduous about how you apply your resource. Maintaining balance in terms of um, my, you know, family. So for me, family is the most important thing. And, and I say the same thing for our team, that if somebody turns up, turns up at the office and, and they've got a sick child or they're, they're absent-minded because of that, we don't ask a second question. It's just go and sort out the home, home front first, because that's the most important thing. Um, uh, but I sort of, and I don't want to be too buzzy on you, John, but I, I prefer the term of followership in term, rather than leadership. That, you know, I think the, the nature of leadership is to empower others to be able to step up. And that people, fund, you're only a leader because somebody fundamentally chooses to follow you. And in order to do that, and in order to sort of engender the sense of followership, it's about, you know, where are we going as an organisation? Have we clearly articulated that? And do people understand what their role is in that? So I think the clarity of purpose and anchoring fundamentally to a why, you know, the, the fundamental why of, of, of our existence, and that is in our organisation to improve the quality of life of small business, so that everyone is anchored around that. Yeah, fantastic. Andrew, thanks for uh, coming on the show today. Pleasure. And I uh, believe we may have locked you in for a guest appearance at Accountants Big Day Out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Looking forward to it. I think you know, what you guys are up to with Accountants Big Day Out is a, is a great initiative. I mean, anything that brings the profession together yeah, and just looks at the big issues facing the profession. Uh, but it also provides practical support to members and accountants just to navigate through that. I think it you know, should be supported. So well done. Look forward yeah. to being part of it. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, John.